are you being honest with yourself, right? Like, are you truly, truly being honest with yourself? Meaning, do you really want it? Do you really want something? Are you truly desiring something? Are you trying to truly achieve it for the right reasons? Or, or are you lying to yourself? Welcome to Mindset Lessons from the Field. I'm Gina Kazaza, the author of the upcoming memoir, Training with a Seal. Today's guest is a former Navy SEAL. He served our beautiful country for 20 years before retiring. Today, he sits on several company boards. He is the author of the book, Leadership is Overrated. He is also the co-founder of Cultural Force, a coaching program which gives you the advice, accountability, and support you need to grow your business Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Kyle Bucket. Kyle, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. So you're interesting. You're an entrepreneur at 12 years old, and <laughs> which is really, really incredible. You don't see 12-year-old being, well, not every day, being so ambitious. So was like having an idea and... um just acting on that idea, something that always like <laughs> lived in you. It's funny, you know, fast forward 20, 20 years later <laughs> when, you know, I'm in my late thirties uh, in the, in the SEAL teams and I was running, you know, somewhat of an innovation cell within uh, the training command, the advanced training command. And uh, I had a little poster inside of my office that said ideas are shit. <laughs> execution execution is everything right so and and when someone would come into my um office they knew if it was you know the good idea fairy they knew i was just going to point to my wall <laughs> while they were talking and then you know they might step back take a step back or two out of the office oh okay okay buck my nickname okay okay buck uh we'll, we'll come back when it's fully flushed out and we're, we have an a uh, plan for execution. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, to, to the question, you know, ideas are phenomenal. Everyone's got one. Everyone's got a thousand of them, but it really boils down. You just nailed it. Execution. Execution is the name of the game. And, you know, one thing that, um, that always is forgotten about the Navy SEAL community is that what we do better than everyone else on the planet is we execute at a very, very basic and fundamental level better than anyone else. Like, think about it, right? Like, we can pull a trigger, just this movement, better than anyone else. We can swim, again, very basic, swimming. We can run with equipment and gear, or we can jump out of a plane better than anyone else. Those are all the basics, the fundamentals, to go out and execute, you know, a very complex mission. So, uh the the fundamentals uh the basic execution of you know just any business any organization structuring correctly and on and on and on is is critical it's paramount right ideas are great i love them i'm an idea man i love ideas but uh execution's everything do you think that starting at such a young age um really like what what makes a 12 year old have an idea and then like I'm going to start well, a business and starts <laughs> acting, acting on it. I was, you know, I was unique. I, I was different. I wasn't great at school. I, I just had, uh, again, I had ideas uh, mm -hmm. and I wanted to execute on those ideas. Um, and so, you know, this, the classroom was not the scene for me. I wanted to be in the boardroom at, at a young age. Right. I just wanted to be innovating. I wanted to be, to be creating money and value for my customers or clients. And so for me, you know, it was just that desire. And honestly, if I could dissect where that came from, it would be challenging. I think it was, you know, I was surrounded in a very academic home, you know, my brothers uh, and my sister and my parents and my aunts and uncles um, I have a lot, I have doctors, uh, you know, double, double, um, you know, majors in my family. Every, it was a very academic family that I came from. And so I found myself like, hey, I'm not really into this. This isn't for me. I know I'm not going to do great at studying how the prescribed old plan is of going to school, then going to, you know, college 
or a community college and then going to get my master's or my doctorate. I know I'm not going to excel in that arena. That's just not how I learn. I learn by actually getting my hands dirty, getting my hands greasy, and that's how I learn. So I think it was probably something along those lines, right? Like you're fascinated or you decide on what is bringing you excitement, personal excitement. And for me, it was really learning, hey, this is not going to work. This is not going to drive profit. This is not going to drive revenue um, at a young age. And I and I had to learn and make <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands of mistakes, because that's just how I learned. Yeah, I wasn't going to learn at a B school. It wasn't it just wasn't for me. I totally understand that. Um, yeah. Now, your dad brought home a Navy SEAL book, and that's when you were like, I want to be a Navy SEAL, right? And you like spent, stayed up all night studying, right? How old you. were you when that happened? When he brought Man, home the book? You are you are well researched for this uh, pod. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Off yeah. to you. Good for you. Um, I was. 17. I was in my senior year of high school. I had already made up my mind. I was determined to join the military. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking at the time I was going to join uh, the army because I loved, you know, the Chuck Norris movies of the 80s. Um, and so I was fascinated with um, the army and special forces. And my dad brought home that book and, and he was like, hey, I know you want to join the army, but you really love the water. You love everything about the water. You love being around rivers, lakes, oceans, streams, pools, whatever. You just like being around the water. You should check out these guys. So uh, I did. I read that. He gave me that book and I stayed up till like five in the morning, just pounding through it. I was fascinated. I was captivated. Um, and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so then on your 18th birthday, the very day you yep. turned 18, you signed your Navy yep. SEAL contract. I, I skipped school. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped school. Uh, my mom was very not happy. She was uh, very pissed. Uh, I skipped school and uh, I was sitting there on the recruiter's doorstep waiting for them to open the door. And as soon as they did, I, I had signed the dotted line. You see, I was um, asking and begging my parents for months to come to the recruiter's office with me. I had already taken the test, the uh, the ASVAB test. Mm -hmm. I had done all the requirements, but I was still 17. And so you have to have parental consent at 17. And so they wouldn't they wouldn't give me parental consent. They were like, no, you need to finish high school. And uh, obviously I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there I was, the morning of my 18th birthday, which for the, uh, for the listener, it was in February of my senior year of high school. So I obviously still had, you know, five months left, really. Did you school. finish school? I did not. No, <laughs> I did not. And it's funny. Um, I joined, I joined the, the army, but you know, I got to go back. I give, I got to give credit where credit is due. I, my parents, God bless them. They're amazing. Uh, they just put through hell and high water to give me and my brothers and sisters a great education at a private, very small, very small academic uh, parochial school where my mother actually taught. And, um, and so I had, I did have a good education that enabled me to score very high on the ASVAB test. The, the Navy will actually were like, Hey, do you want to come and be a nuclear, um, you know, and go into the nuke program? And uh, it's, it does really go back to the fundamentals that I learned from, you know, being in that school, no doubt. But at the same time, I, I, I didn't finish. So I get to, I get to the Navy and I'm in boot camp and the Navy, I'll never forget this. The Navy just hands me my GED. They're like, Hey, your score's so high. Like, here you go. Here's your GED. I, I, I do not remember taking a GED test at all. They're like, here you go. Here's your GED. Congratulations. I was like, great. Perfect. I'm on my way. <laughs> Did you send it back home to your parents to frame that? <laughs> they, they they actually did not appreciate it at all. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted me to finish high school. They wanted me to go to college. That was the path they they really desired for me back then. So it's all good. With yeah, well, let me back up like a hair. So 17, you get the book, 18, you sign your contract. What was the training like from 17 to 18? Were you training? Yeah, yeah. So 
Great question. So getting ready before joining the military, I was um, just doing the basics. Uh, <laughs> funny enough, going back to our conversation two minutes ago, uh, focusing on the basics, the fundamentals, right? Making sure my swim time was going to be within you know, the requirement. Uh, making sure my run time, which is where I actually had to focus a lot of my training time on, was my run. My swim was fine because, again, I was I was a water rat. I loved being around the water. So my swim was the least of my problems. Um, but I had to focus on getting my run time down. So that consisted of running, you know, between two and a half to eight miles uh, six days a week, right? Um, eating Eating clean. Uh, you know, obviously I'm in, I'm a teenager, so I'm not really worried about alcohol, like as an adult, but, uh, you know, eating clean as clean as I could, uh, consuming as much protein as I could, uh, but really training on a, on a six day, six day a week for the runs, uh, sprinkled with, uh, weight training, uh, also, you know, calisthenics, um, and any and a lot of push-ups and sit-ups, a lot of push-ups and sit-ups. <laughs> who uh, who put this and, program and pull-ups together? and pull-ups? Um, uh, the program was put together by yours truly. <laughs> I had nobody really? back then. You know, um, I grew up in a in a city just north of New York City, uh, in New York. Uh, I didn't really have, there was not really a military presence there. I didn't really have anyone in the network to kind of reach out to. I didn't, I definitely didn't even know a Navy SEAL or know anyone remotely close to the Navy SEAL community. So I had no one to ask. Um, the internet, you know, wasn't what it is today. So it's not like I could go on LinkedIn and find someone, you know, that I couldn't, Google didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you know, it was, it was challenging. And so I just literally looked, I found the basic requirements from the neighbor recruiter. They gave me the basic requirements and I just built a program based around that. Okay. If I can just get through these basic requirements, if I can just do the timed run, the timed push-ups, the sit-ups, the pull-ups, the swim, if I can just, fo let me just focus on that for now, the rest will come. So I really just put all my effort into making sure I could do a great, you know, physical test. Where'd that self-discipline come from to like show up for yourself every single day to put out when you, I'm sure there were days you didn't want to. I mean, there are days where I'm, it's a gym day sure. for me. I'm in the car and I'm waiting 30 minutes just to go inside. It's like, I made the journey here. So how do you do it? Like, how did you do it at such a young age? Because I just feel like, especially as a teenager, like it's so much easier to not show up for yourself. Yeah, it's such a good, good question. You know, I talk about this a lot with, you know, organizations that we work with um, or teams that I'm working with or leading. And, you know, really what it boils down to is, are you being honest with yourself? Right? Like, are you truly, truly being honest with yourself? Meaning, do you really want it? Do you really want something? Are you truly desiring something? Are you trying to truly achieve it for the right reasons? Or, or are you lying to yourself, right? Like if you're going after something that you are not lying about to yourself, it's going to be 10 times easier. If you're going after something, <clears throat> excuse me, for the wrong reasons, or if you're going after something because you think that's something you want, it's going to be extremely challenging. So, you know, if you're, you have to ask yourself truly looking deep within yourself and saying, Hey, do I really want this? Do I really, really want this? Cause if I do, it's going to be that much easier to achieve. It's going to be that much easier to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and get ready, uh, you know, for the day or ready for the, you know, the, the meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like, hey, am I happy in that training? Am I happy in that preparatory work? Am I happy in the execution of, you know, this, this role or this job or this, you know, sport? And, you know, a lot of times, sometimes people at that point will have to take a step back and go, dang, Kyle, you know what? You're right. I, I was lying to myself. What I'm really excited about is over there great. Okay. Let's go work towards achieving that. Right. And so when you find what it is, and for me, I just, I got blessed that the fact was I got, um, you know, excited at a young age 
in serving our country in an elite maritime force. Um, something that, you know, from a young age, I was loving being around the water, right? And I wanted to serve the country in an elite manner. And I got really excited about that. And sure enough, fast forward, I get through the training. And then every single step of my career, I got more and more excited about it, right? Um, and so when you're doing that, and when you're loving what you're doing, the prep, the prep is nothing, right? Just like, it's just like anything. If you love doing podcasts, you're like you've done a phenomenal job here today, prepping for this podcast, right? Um, you've done a phenomenal job researching for the interview. You probably enjoyed that, right? So to you, it's not, it's not work, but for someone else, it, it might be, oh man, this is a slog. I got to read about this person or that person. I got to let me look at their history. And, you know, for someone else, it might be a schlog, but why are they doing it? Right. So I think it really goes back to that. Like, hey, why are you doing it? Um, and, you know, honestly, for I know a lot of people out there these days might be challenged with, hey, why do I want to be healthy? Right that's a challenge. That's a real, real challenge in America today. Right. And why do you want to be healthy? If you, if you can't answer that, that's a, that's a slippery, slippery slope. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by my absolute favorite company. If you know me or seen videos or photos of me, then you know, I always have one on my wrist. I absolutely adore this company. Discover on the DiscoverOmnia.com is the world's first smart crystal bracelet. Every single bracelet is handmade in the USA. Using real genuine crystals made on memory wire, every bracelet is unisex and they're also aromatherapy. The cool part is the black onyx charm that is on the bracelet. It scans to your cell phone, connecting you to their wellness hub Elevate. You can also access their Wellness Hub Elevate on your computer or tablet. You just have to sign into your account. The bracelet gives you a 12 month membership. It has over 200 pieces of self care content from motivational tips, meditations, breathing exercises, exercises around the theme of your bracelet, printable journals, and so much more. The content is ever growing. And that's not all. The bracelet also gives you lifetime access to their Elevate Together Club, which meets monthly via Zoom. Each month is themed, giving you actionable takeaways to elevate your life. And with this podcast episode, you get 40% off your purchase order by using the code Mindset Podcast. Use that code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Just go to discoveromnia.com. DiscoverOmnia.com, code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Get your bracelet today. With all, you're getting said a lot. your. No, I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. There was so much to take in, but I, I want, I'm curious. It makes sense. I mean, I 100% agree with everything, but I want to know how, when you're excited about something, there's still those days where you're just like, I don't want to do it, right? Sure. Or for yourself, you're like doing push-ups and you hit a point where it's like, this is really painful. Right. And you have to just keep going and keep going until you, you collapse. Right. How did you keep going and going um, to push through that pain? Because nobody's watching you. Right. Right. Well, it goes to how bad you really want it. Number one, I've already said that, but it also goes to a little bit of having a chip on your shoulder too, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for me, I definitely had a chip on my shoulder because <laughs> here's, what, here's what happened. The second, the second I joined to become a Navy SEAL, all of a sudden, uh, let's go back five minutes ago when I said I didn't have any experts. Well, when I signed that dotted line, Oh my God, everyone was an expert. <laughs> everyone was an expert. Everyone all of a sudden is telling me how I'm never going to become a Navy SEAL, 
right? Oh, you can't do that. You know, Kyle, those guys don't ever sleep. You know, they go for an entire week during that, you know, the basic training without any sleep. You can't do that. You've never done that. You know, you got to be able to run pretty far. You got to be able to swim pretty far. You got to be able to shoot pretty good. You know, you've never done that. You know, you're going to jump out of an airplane. You never done that. Um, and on and on and on. You get my point, right? And so then I get to training. I get to basic training and I have a whole new set of experts, <laughs> a whole new set of experts. It's all of the other students, right? And all the other students are saying, oh, this is this is the challenge. This is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. And all those experts that are running their mouth and talking are the ones that start slowly quitting. And they're dropping out and they're ringing the bell and they're 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 requesting a, a drop on request, as we call it, a D.O.R. They're ringing the bell and all of those experts start fading away. And uh, so to a degree, it became a little bit of a chip on my shoulder saying, well, <laughs> everyone around. Me, I'm saying I want this. This is what I want to do. And everyone around me is saying, yeah, you can't do it. Well, this is what I want to do. So I'm going to freaking go do it. <laughs> um, and so there is a little bit of that, uh, the chip on the shoulder, right? Uh, that's for sure. But then, you know, pushing through to to the question of, you know, the pain and the suffering, and especially for us, the cold, cold water, you have to take your mind to a little bit of a place of seeing what's over the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. For example, right, when I am starting a new company, there's one part of that that I really hate. There's a slog that I really hate. When it's a capital intensive company, the fundraising of a company, raising capital, I hate it, right? I hate it. And it reminds me of, you know, that basic training where you're just, you're just sucking it up. You're going through the cold water. You just, you just have to suck it up because you're looking at, at your goal, your end goal saying, Hey, what I want to do is months ahead. I still have months of this, of, of this, this torture uh, to get through, to get to my end goal. And so again, the ones that are lying to themselves or not realizing, hey, what it's going to actually take to get to that end goal, that's the big aha moment, right? Like spend a little bit of freaking research to understand, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds. Okay. What is the research that it takes to go and lose 50 pounds? Hey, I want to create a $100 million company. Okay. Is it capital intensive? Yes. Okay. You're going to have to raise a lot of money to get there, potentially, right? You're going to have to build a team, right? And so when you don't spend that time analyzing and research this goal that you set for yourself, that's where it becomes very challenging for us because they don't spend the time in the beginning to say, hey, did I, did I research this properly? Because why is, am I putting myself through all this suffering? Oh man, I didn't realize it was going to be this tough. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does that go back to? It goes back to, you didn't really analyze the situation. You didn't spend any time researching. You didn't understand what the path was going to be to achieve that goal. And so that is what really matters, right? Like I knew, I didn't know, no fully everything that was going to come, but I knew that it was going to be brutal. I knew that it was going to be cold. I mean, even in the nineties, you do a little bit of research and you can understand that Navy SEAL training is the most horrific professionalized military training on the planet. So, and I knew, okay, there's going to be this week in there that I'm not going to sleep for a, for a, for a week. I'm not going to get any sleep. Um, so I knew, and I had to prep my body and I'll never forget, you know, we're two weeks away from hell week. And one of my best buddies at the time looks like freaking Chris Hemsworth from Thor. He, he comes running up to me and he's like, can't do it, man. I'm out. And I remember looking at him and going, holy moly, that guy just quit. That guy's faster than me. Uh, he's, he's stronger than me. 
maybe smarter than me. He's better looking than me, all the things, right? And he just quit. And I'll never forget, I go to bed that night and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that guy just quit. I'm not quitting. I got this chip on my shoulder. And I wake up the next morning with a whole new set of problems. I wake up with an inflamed IT band. I have pain from my hip to my ankle. And it's excruciating. I mean, excruciating. And the reason why I tell that story um, is because if you ask any team guy, hey, what went wrong with your body to make it through the basic training? Every single one of us, every single one of us have a story. And that pain in my leg lasted for weeks leading into Hell Week. It was brutal. And listen, the morning of Hell Week, I got a, I get another new problem. I wake up the morning of Hell Week. We're getting ready. And I'm like, all right, tonight's the night. I wake up and I have a whole new problem. I developed 102.5 degree temperature. Oh, I'm, I'm running hot. I feel like crap. And I go to the medic and I'm like, and he's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I'm not giving up. You're going to have to, they're going to have to kick me out. I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm pushing through, pushing through. I made it this far. Right. And the point of why I say all that is I was never lying to myself. Like I knew everything was coming. I knew all of the pain was coming. I knew it was going to be excruciating. Right. But I had the end goal in mind. I wanted to get to the point where I could go and serve our country and operate uh, in that manner. And I couldn't do that without getting through this phase. So let me ask you, as you tell these stories, because from my research, um, you right? got uh, you got let go the first time you got kicked out because of underage drinking. That's so is right. this the first time? And so is your story right now your second time or your first that, time? That that one's the second. Yeah. Second. So yep. when you were ready to go, at what point did you end up getting kicked out? Like to oh, oh, so yeah. so yeah, so let's back up. So I get kicked out for a young at a young age, right? I went right in. Right through uh, basic uh, military training uh, boot camp, the Navy's boot camp, and then right to buds. And mm. so, you know, I'm 19 at this point and uh, 19 underage. Um, and so I went out on the uh, on the island. I was on the island, actually. And I got kicked and I got uh, I had a beer, literally a beer. Right. And um, I wasn't a drinker back then. Um and uh, I, it was probably one of the first times, honestly, I'd ever consumed alcohol, but it didn't matter because I was underage. So immediately uh, I was removed from training and rightfully so. There's a no no alcohol policy, especially underage drinking, as there should be. Um, and so I had to go serve the military and I actually did all, three deployments before I had to come. Then I got to come back a couple of years later. Now, did you know? that you were going to be able to go back and give buds a second, a second shot. Like, did you no, know that you had no idea? Not at all. No so idea. What was going on when you got let go and uh, what was going on through your mind when you've trained for this for so long, you put your program together and then that one beer changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Right. Um, but I wasn't going to give up. Like that was a goal. So I jacked up, but I wasn't going to give up, right? I screwed up, but I wasn't going to give up. So I just put my head down. I just worked hard. I did the best of my job so that I could get a glowing review from the command leadership to approve me to go back to the training. Um, and so I could have been Mr. Negative Nancy in those uh, in those two, two, two years uh, where I was away, but um, I decided not to. I said, hey, I'm just going to be awesome at everything I do. And I taught myself uh, several, trying to think about this, it's been a while since I talked about this. Uh, I taught myself several specialties uh, mm -hmm. within um, the the Navy that uh, I didn't actually even go to school for. Um, and so I taught myself, I got qualified uh, on several different qualifications worked my way up. And then eventually uh, just, you know, through stellar performance, I was approved to go back into the program. 
So what was that like? You get, you get, you get approved so then, to go back. <laughs> so then I go back and here we go all over again. Right. And so the stories I was just talking about was now I'm back. Those were those stories. Yeah. So because now I got, when I got kicked out the first time, it was very early in training. Okay. Got it. Yeah. 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 So, so now you're second time. Well, technically, right. Um, class two, four, nine. Is that Correct. accurate statement? Winter, Correct. right? February yep, 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 time. Yep. Absolutely freezing. Now, was the first time around the same time too? Or um the first time would have been a not a summer hell week, but it would have been like a November hell week. And listen, I'm a surfer. Uh my favorite favorite day to surf in San Diego is Thanksgiving morning because Thanksgiving morning can actually, the water can actually still be kind of warm sometimes. Maybe a two mil wetsuit is required, maybe even a one mil or a cheater top, but um, usually the waves are good and the water's not that cold. Fast forward to February, March, my hell week, the water was 51 degrees. It was cold. It was really cold. Did you freezing. prep? Is there prepping? Do you like, do you like take cold showers or like, do, is that even like preparation? <laughs> <laughs> like, Yeah. You can do some plunges. Um, but uh, it, you definitely don't want to go into that program. And that's the first time you've ever been in cold water. That's for sure. Cause the shock, the shock of, of being in cold water. Now it's pretty popular. You know, you, you go on, you know, Instagram or TikTok, you see people doing plunge pools all over the world. But, uh, back then it wasn't that popular. So, um, you know, you had to prep, you had to be prepared for it. But at the same time, you're in that water from the minute you show up. I mean, you're in it pretty quick. <laughs> so the meaning, meaning, you know, a month or two later, when you're actually starting hell week, you've been in cold water quite a bit leading up to that. I'll just say like, I've done cold plunges. Like <laughs> it's not fun anytime for me. Like it's, <laughs> and, and it takes my body a bit to um like get over it shock. And also my mind, I'm like, I see the ice on the water and I'm just like, no, you know, and I have to keep right. fighting that, fighting that. Did you mm -hmm. have that at all throughout training where you had to fight yourself from psyching you out? Did you have any moments like that? Probably, you know, not necessarily with the cold water. I think for me, I had been in cold water quite a bit leading up to it. So um, I just knew it was going to suck. So it's like, okay, here, here we go. Just prep. Okay, here we go again. Mm -hmm. Boom, this sucks. Um, but What's you know, the there mindset are other... prep. you mentioned just prep. So like, how do you, how you, you just are like, it's just going to suck. We just got to do it anyway. Is that, that's the prep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when, when I believe this is just me, I'm not speaking for everybody, but I believe when you start over analyzing everything, it's going to make it 10 times harder. Right. When you're sitting there and you're just talking to yourself and talking to yourself and talking to yourself and talking to yourself and prepping and prepping and prepping, it's like, hey, eventually, again, back to my board, my uh, my note on my in my office, ideas are crap, executions, everything, right? Like, just execute, just execute, just get in the freaking mm -hmm. cold water, and it, yes, it sucks, but uh, when you're sitting there and just prepping your mind and you're not executing you get into this mode, this mentality of overanalyzing everything, right? I know, so, I know overanalyzing. I'm a woman. That's what we do. Um. <laughs> your words, your words, not mine, not mine. But um, when you, when we as humans get into something where we overanalyze everything, sometimes it's time to just put everything down and just execute and do and fail, right? There's nothing wrong sometimes with failing. We learn from our mistakes so much we learn from our mistakes so much right more so than we do our successes a lot of times and so you know you got to be prepared to not be afraid to fail and one thing that we do in seal training is we ensure and we look for the candidates who are not afraid to fail right that's what makes us so successful is we screen out the ones who 
mentally they have to win they have to win and when they can't win they quit those are the group those are the individuals that don't make it through our training pipeline um because it really messes with their head right so because they're over analyzing like how can i win this how can i win this and winning becomes the goal as opposed to just executing and learning from your failures right um and the reason we do that is because when a mission is at its worst right what are you are you just going to give up when you didn't win or are you just going to keep going and just keep readjusting and executing and trying to figure out a new solution um it really jacks with the human mind when you are so focused on winning and what do we do right we attract individuals from the best i mean the best the the high school quarterback the star right that's the kids that are showing up to navy seal training the ath the the track and field star um, those are the ones that are showing up. And a lot of times those are also the ones that are quitting because of that mind shift of, oh man, you, there's no way to win this. I can't win this. It doesn't end. It just keeps going for months on end. This training's brutal, right? Um, and so when you're in that mentality of overanalyzing something and focused on, hey, I've got to win, it can, it can be problematic. <laughs> it can really mess with your head. You mentioned, I believe, in in one of the interviews I was listening to, like, um, it I guess it was. I don't know if you mentioned something about it being easier, like, to shut off because there's so much going on. You know, um, there's you're you're you have an action that you're doing. You're always doing something. You're in pain. Um, there's just a lot going on where you really couldn't think but execute. Right. Is that is that a true statement? Yeah, yeah. Just execute. Um, and what do you do when you, again, what do you do when you fail in that execution? You learn. And so you don't do it again. So, I mean, the big thing is we also give the students multiple chances, multiple opportunity to learn from their mistakes. Right. And then we just keep compounding problems, new problems, new problems, new problems. So that, uh, you know, you're constantly learning, you're learning how to get through failure, but you're also learning how to adjust and not make the same mistake again, right? But that can mess with someone's head when they're always, always failing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? It can really mess with their with the individual's head when you're when there's like no way, no path to success. Man, they're just gonna figure out a new way to make me fail. That's right, buddy. Get back in the cold water. So, how do you? Um, I guess. Uh, how do you stay calm and not frustrated um, if if that's a thing, like to get back up from failure and get back up and get back up when you're going to constantly keep failing the whole? Um, you know, for me, I think about the humor in it. Uh, me and my buddies will talk about it. And I always regard it as like the funniest six to eight months of my life. Like there's just so much comedy that happens and transpires. Right. Um, and, you know, years later, someone will come up to me and they'll be like, Hey, Buck, remember when this happened? I'm like, Oh my God, I totally forgot about that. You know? And so, you know, focusing on the comedy, focusing on, you know, the laughter on your buddies that are going through the pain and the misery, the team that's going through the pain and misery of that failure together and saying, all right, buckle up buttercup. Let's now let's come together. Let's lock arms. Let's figure out a solution on how we can get to a path of success. Um, you know, that's, that's just one way. I mean, smiles are contagious, right? They really are. Uh, and so when you just focus on, Hey, what's going to be, you know, that resilience, what's going to help us with adaptability. Um, I believe one of the biggest things is going to be, you know, just smiling and supporting each other and patting each other on the back, encouraging one another. Um, and when you do that, you realize, well, it's what made us one of the most highest performance teams, performing teams in the world. It's really what made us one of the most highest and lethal best performing teams in the world. 
is really about it's not our strength necessarily as the at the individual level right it's not our intelligence at an individual level it's really about our willingness to be there for one another how do you, how do you develop this like how do you develop that i guess resiliency to just keep on to keep on going to keep on showing up to staying positive to uh not overthink to keep executing um and just to, to stay calm it really matters on your goals are your goals aligned to the effort or is your effort aligned to the goals because where everyone will get frustrated and will lose a lot of motivation, I've seen this a thousand times, is when their effort is not aligned to their goals, right? So they're spinning, spinning, spinning the wheels, uh, like you know, a hamster on a wheel, and working their butts off, and then they're not coming anywhere close to their goal, it's because the effort wasn't necessarily aligned to it. And so, it's a lot easier to get frustrated when you're that hamster on the wheel and the wheels on a road and you're getting closer to the goal mm -hmm. as opposed to it's on a spindle or whatever and you're just spinning, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So when that goal is in, is in sight or you see the path to achievement, the frustration, the hurdles to get past are much more um, palatable than when, you know, there's no, there's no end in sight or you're going the opposite direction. Your efforts are taking you further and further away from the goal. That's when everyone gets frustrated. When the, the effort is moving towards the goal, whether it's hurdles, whether it's, you know, you know, a lot, a team loss, a, you know, a resource or an asset loss, but you're still pushing forward, that's where everyone can come together and realize, all right, we that sucks. Okay, we got to deal with this, but we're still on the way to our goal. When the asset loss, the resource loss, the team loss, whatever it might be, pushes you in the complete opposite direction of the goal, that's where everyone gets really frustrated as a team. And that's when you start getting bickering. That's when you get side conversations. That's where, you know, teams just completely fall apart. It's hard to encourage everybody because they know you're full of crap because you're not moving closer to the goal. You're not getting closer to the achievement. And so when teams do that, sometimes you have to just take a big, hey, let's reset Let's reset and let's all push to ensure that, you know, now our effort's going to be aligned on a path towards whatever it is we're trying to achieve. When you were going through Hell Week, um, I don't think when it was over, 17 of you were left. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now you started off with a fever, you just said. And mm -hmm. um, now, how was it getting through that? Not only with the fever, but then like you're seeing people like dropping and you're still you're still in it. The guys that are with you are still in it as others are dropping, but also you're, well, as you mentioned, you're, you have a fever as you're going through this. You had this pain going on, like what's going on and how do you push, push through and uh, keep on going? You know, I had to really focus on being a good teammate. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to focus at that point on, you know, collaboration if you will mm -hmm. uh communicating swiftly and efficiently with the team um and really just being around right uh at this point no one was envious of my oh we should probably back up actually now that i think about it because mm -hmm. tuesday night of hell week mm -hmm. uh one of my buddies you know rings out and then all of a sudden the, the instructors are losing their minds and um, they're looking around and they're trying to uh, find out who's the next guy in charge. And uh, lo and behold, <laughs> I didn't know it, but it was me. I was the next uh, leading petty officer, uh, the tactical lead, if you will, uh, up in the chain of command. And I didn't know this. 
So now here I am, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I need to focus on being a great teammate. I need to just make sure I can get through the training, but now all of a sudden I've got added responsibility. Right. And so nobody's looking to me um, with envy. It's the exact opposite. It's a very, very unique position. It's a very unique position. No one necessarily wants it because, uh, Every time the class screws up or isn't following directions, you know, the OIC and I would pay for it. You know, if we missed a, a timeline, if we missed, you know, a head count or whatever it might be, they would punish uh, the OIC and I extra, extra special, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so at that point in time, you know, come Wednesday morning, uh, I'm just focused on trying to be a good teammate, uh, collaborative and encourager <laughs> and, uh, and being good on my communication. Right. And so what I had to do, at least this is what I did. Um, I just started being the encourager, the cheerleader, the jokester, if you will, uh, patting everyone on the back and just repeating, Hey, we got this. We we're crushing it. We can do it. We're almost there. And, um, and to my point earlier, we got to a place of, uh, I think, laughter. I mean, we were laughing a lot already, but we got to a place of laughter where, you know, no one, no one quit. So it was pretty cool. Wow, uh, that is really cool. Um, I want to uh, usually focus on training and stuff because I really feel like that's where your mindset is really start. You're, it's getting strong. You also are understanding how strong your mind is. Um, and everything over the body. Um, you said something that I wanted to touch base though on two things. Um, one was something about like, you talked about business and it was like, you don't realize, but like there's a lot of training involved for, for being a SEAL, like to get to the level that you're at. And when you're always like, and when you graduate and everything, it's, it's constant training, it's constant learning. It's, it just, right. it never ends. Right? right. And, um, and it's the same thing, like, as you mentioned, like in business or with the team or the people that we're with, like, it's not just like you train them. It's like, it's a whole journey of, of them developing and through your book, um, th through the book of, uh, leadership is overrated. Um, from what I thought it was really interesting on the fact that, uh, could your company survive without you? And it really boils yeah. down to your team, your whole entire team. And right. what you talked about um, was how you focused on everybody else and laughed and joked and, and did all that. Is that when you started to learn and develop the whole leadership is overrated and it's more about everyone and the team? And then I want to know more about the whole um, developing developing people and, and how we we develop people. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. You nailed it. Um, that's exactly when I started understanding that this, this old maniacal, you know, leader sitting on top of his castle, it might've worked, you know, in ancient kingdoms. Uh, but it, it's not going to, it's not going to work in today's society and it doesn't work well, honestly, in, in general, you can actually get a lot more productivity increased profitability, et cetera, et cetera, from teams who are self-led, teams who are loving to come in to work, uh, loving what they do, and on and on and on. So, you know, we started focusing on, hey, how do we create an environment uh, that can do that? Uh, how can you create an environment of, of self-led teams and organizations that will really thrive, right? And so, you know, to, to that end, I mean, <laughs> wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, where you want to go from there? <laughs> well, I want to know um, the whole, well, I wanted to know really from that story, like where it started. And for me, listening to your story, it felt like that's where this book kind of, this idea of leadership is overrated got, um, got developed. And, um, how is it yeah. when you, I come from the film business. Okay. Like right. there's a lot of egos there. 
And, sure. um, and it's like, usually like when you get to that very top, um, it's, uh, the people below you, you know, the peasants, um, and right. you don't treat them really well and everything like that. Sure. And, um, I also used to back in the day, like work in a restaurant and I worked in two restaurants and one treated their employees. Amazing. You were important. So I wanted to be there. I wanted to work. And then the other one didn't. And they, they, right. they treated the customers that came in more important than us who show up every day for them. So I didn't care as much. I cared for myself because I want, I don't like to let me down and not do a good job, but I didn't care so much for them. And um, how do you, from your book, like leadership is overrated, like how do you build that solid team of letting go of all those egos and that I'm above you and, you know, type, type of mentality? Hmm. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting. You know, the film, the film industry is a is a very unique um, dynamic, right? Because uniquely, a director, um, you know, an executive producer has a lot full of people who are just going to do anything it takes, right, to get fifteen seconds behind that camera, behind that lens. It'll be really interesting, you know, to see how that industry evolves over the next 20 years where now everyone can be a star on, you know, social media, streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be interesting. And I have a theory. Um, it's going to take a while for it to fully bake, but I have a theory that the ones who follow the premise in our book are going to be the ones, the directors, the producers are going to be the ones that really thrive and rise to the top and just make quality, great content. Um, but, you know, back to that question, I, uh, you know, for for me, I really, really paid attention to it, the concept of killing the leader when I watched us as, you know, Navy SEALs actually do that in training, right? It's a very unique very unique dynamic when in training uh the leader dies and bombs are going off fireworks are flying overhead it's chaos um you know there's bullets flying overhead and all of a sudden the guy who's supposed to be in charge is now dead and you get to watch as the organization reacts as the team reacts to uh to that situation you get to watch as the next guy steps up uh and takes and assumes the role and responsibility or the third or fourth guy in the chain of command steps in and just takes over because the second guy couldn't um you get to watch the the his ability and how well the original leader the one who's now playing playing dead uh had trained him how much he had empowered him in the past, uh, how much he had been encouraging for that individual to learn the role. Uh, and you also get to see how the team now reacts to his assumed responsibility, right? So three things happen. Number one, the leader who's playing dead gets to see how good he did, right? Mm -hmm. How good of a job have I been doing training the next guy? The next guy gets to execute and see how good he could do if that happens in that role. And then there's the most important one. Good old number three. Mm -hmm. The team sees it. And you better believe that even though, you know, bullets are flying, uh, bombs are exploding, chaos is ensuing, when you're a team guy in that situation – you might your ears perk up a little bit and you pay attention. You know what's going on because, hey, John Doe's now in the seat. Oh, how's John Doe going to do? Um, and so the team, number three, the team gets to see. And now you're on you're on the world's most elite interview. Right. Because the team is not the entire team is going to judge how good of a job is number two doing. Right. Mm hmm. And then they're going to step back after everything's over and 
all three groups are going to go, hey, number one guy, how good of a job have you been doing training number two? Hey, number two guy, are you ready? He's been doing a great job training you and you sucked at it. Or the whole team goes, hey, both of you guys sucked, <laughs> you know, um, or wow, you guys are doing great. This is amazing. Now it's time. Let's try it with the number three guy or the number four guy or even the number five guy and on and on and on. You get my point. But doing that, enabling and saying, hey, what happens in any organization when you, uh, you know, take the leader out or the leader just checks out and goes on vacation for a week and turns off their cell phone, can the organization thrive? Can the organization succeed? Uh, has that person at the top been developing the next round of leaders? Um, or have they not? Does chaos ensue, right? Uh, is the individual so focused on, I've got to have the answers for everything that the next, you know, the next three or four or seven people can't, you know, make any decisions. Uh, and when you don't have uh, decision making at the lowest level, <laughs> that's when you have major problems, right? So that's what it really kind of stemmed from. How do you, um, I guess, like make a decision? Like, um, shouldn't, like, you make decisions every day, right? Every day we're making right, a decision on what right. to eat, you know, what everything. Right. But especially in business, right? Especially as a SEAL serving the country, there's lives on the line, right? Um, how do you make the dis how do you uh, make a decision? It's not about making the wrong dis it's not about making the right decision, it's about making like the least worst decision, I guess, in a way. Um, from what I've been taught, it's like, it's not like you're not going to make a mistake. It's just making a mistake. That's not going to, you know, lose Be a catastrophic. life, you know? Yes, sure. exactly. Exactly. So how do you, um, how do you, uh, get into that head and that mind of, of making that, making a decision and just kind of like hoping that it's like the least catastrophic, <laughs> 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 I, I'm I'm chuckling over here because I know that m most of the most of the individuals who ask me this question mm -hmm. roll roll their eyes at what I'm about to say because it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Um, how you do that is mm -hmm. training. It's training. It's training. How do you give team members the ability? to go and do something, you train them, you educate them. If you've never made a decision or an action, for example, uh, and all of a sudden now you're requested to do it, I mean, in a real world situation, that's that's that could be catastrophic, right? Like, you're not going to hand me, I'm not going to hand you the um, the controls to a helicopter because you've never trained for it. Right. Like I wouldn't just say, hey, here you go, Gina, fly this helicopter. Well, no, you've never trained for it. Um, just like, hey, I'm not going to tell, you know, this this uh, grad student, hey, I want you to write up this contract for uh, this and this acquisition. He's never done it before. <laughs> no one even trained him. Right. So uh, it all goes back to training and then understanding Hey, what are the capabilities of said individual before you put them in that spot, in that in that room? We in corporate America, and trust me, I get it. I was a CHRO. I understand. We often want to just hire someone that's already trained, right? That's the the path of least resistance, or so we think. Hey, let's just hire into it. But you know, we always joke. <laughs> We get asked all the time, wow, how, you guys are so elite. Let's pick your brains, Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. And then we go out and we turn around. You don't hire a Navy SEAL. <laughs> we train them. We create them. We create them. Companies nowadays are so afraid to create professionals, to create teams, right? And so it can be done. It's done at the most elite level, right? Uh, just it's done at, you know, athletic organizations they do it all the time they train and then all of a sudden they become really good right the it's 
it's done all across the world. My point is, is that training enables the opportunity for failures as well, right? And so when you're when you are properly trained, when you're properly edu- educated, when you're properly, you know, going through scenarios at that point, then you have the opportunity to say, okay, this person's ready, right? This person's ready. This person's been backseating me. Maybe it's not a formal training program, but this person's been backseating me for a long time. I've been mentoring this individual. Uh, mentoring is a form of training, right? I've been mentoring this individual, and now this individual is ready to, to hold down the fort while I go to Hawaii uh, for a week of vacation, you know? But it takes time takes time and effort and you got to be disciplined. You got to be intentional and you got to put your mind again, back to our opening statement on, Hey, what's the goal. Okay. Knowing what it's going to take to get to that end goal. What, uh, what do you have? What else, anything else you have to share that can help others improve their lives or anything that you learned in training? Obviously we talked so much about leadership that you learned in training that, I mean, you wrote a whole book on it. Um, but, uh, yeah. is there any, any other tips and things that happened to you that, um, that impacted you so much that it's something that you use on an everyday basis? Yeah, I think many times a lot of us think that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm in this role or I'm in that role. There's not a lot of opportunity for me to be a leader there, Mr. Kyle, right? And I would argue exact opposite. There's plenty of opportunity for great leaders. Um, And where it all starts with is, you know, what we talk about in our book is being, you know, empathetic, just being kind, not being a jerk, and really understanding how you can better the team, how we can all come together and be great communicators. Um, I've worked with so many organizations, right? where you have individuals in certain key leadership positions. I mean, literally almost every position you can think of in an organization, right? Where there's someone there that, yeah, great. They're a great subject matter expert, phenomenal subject matter expert, but they're a horrible, horrible leader. And you can see it with their attrition within their team, right? And so my point is, if you are, an individual thinking like, oh, I'm in, I'm an accountant, you know, I'm a financial planner, I'm a chemist, you know, I'm a scientist, wh- whatever it is, my I'm a janitor, whatever it is. My point is, is that you can take your capability to the next level. You can be a great leader and start on the branch that you're on. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, the old elite title. It doesn't. It really doesn't. There's great leadership at every single level of every sort of organization. And when you do that, when you actually are empathetic, when you're kind, when you go out of your way, and also you're doing a good job at your job, people are going to take notice and people are going to come alongside of you. And you're going to take that organization to the next level. Happens all the time. Happens every day. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed it and I really learned a lot and and I'm I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you. Oh, it's been great. Thank you so much and thanks for everyone that's listening. Please go like, share, comment, subscribe now, be a Patreon member so you can get full access to our bonus episodes and extra goodies that only our Patreons get. And please tune in next week for our next episode. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>